I'm grateful to be with you on All Saints Day, especially given the, the way that we're going to need the prayers and examples of the saints in the days ahead as we're separated from one another. Today, I really wanted to think about what it is to have a Christian name. In the United States, we don't really talk about Christian names. So, so back in Michigan, someone might ask, what is your first name or your last name? But your Christian name and your surname are not really part of our language anymore. And since coming here, I've, I've been thinking about that. And I think that there's a real significance in that, in that change in our language. I think that it, it reveals something about how, how we view the world and how we interpret reality that, that's quite significant. In the collect today, we pray that God would knit us together in the mystical body of Christ, that, that we would all be knit with one another. And this doesn't just mean here in this church, in this place, or even with the other Christians in Cambridge and the many churches that are, that are in, in our vicinity, but, but it, it's talking about the body of Christ across time, across space, the church militant and the church triumphant, that we would all be knit together. And I, I think this is interesting. It's in the mystical body of Christ. So there's something mysterious about this. And it's not something that's actually easy to see. So you can see how uh, we, we innovative Americans could, could say that we could just do away with the, the, the language of your Christian name and say something a little more straightforward, like your, your first name, right? But, but I think All Saints offers us an opportunity to, to notice some of the, the scales that may have come before our eyes. And to pray by the power of God and the Holy Ghost that those would be removed and we could see clearly again. I, I think that, that sometimes when you're trying to, to think through the problems of the, the scales that have come before our eyes and the ways that we're not seeing reality correctly, stories can be very helpful. And, and so one story that stood out to me that I think can, can perhaps help us start to see see. Uh, what All Saints is about and what the Communion of Saints is about, I actually heard in the garden over here. So when I first came to visit, I think it was on a, a Wednesday, and I was chatting with our own Father Robert Van de Weer in the garden, and, and he was telling me about his Christian journey. And you know, he was raised a, a, an atheist. He, he had been baptized because of the love of his grandmother and her desire for him to be a Christian, but, but he had been raised an atheist, and as a young man, he decided he wanted to find the true religion, uh, right? And so he traveled to, to India to see if, if Hinduism was the true religion. And while he was on a train, he was next to a, a, a man, and he, he said, can I come to your ashram and, and meet your guru? And he said, oh, yes, definitely, come with me. Uh, you, can, you can stay with us, you can worship with us, you can learn from us. And as it turned out, when he arrived, this man was a, a Thomas Christian. And so the connection that, that Father Robert made with, with Christianity occurred through a long line of saints. It, it, it didn't just come to him because he was born in England, where there, there happened to be a lot of churches. But instead, he was all the way in India. And, and this is really interesting. So Jesus he commissioned his disciples to go into all nations, baptizing and, and teaching, and telling people the, the good news, that they could be reconciled to God, that they no longer needed to be isolated in their own confusion, in their own blindness, in their own sin, but, but that they could see clearly. And so St. Saint, Saint Thomas, he followed, tradition tells us, that, that he followed the trading patterns of the time and, and went to India and he preached the gospel on the southern coast of India and lots of synagogues and, and villages and lots of churches were founded and he was eventually martyred um, preaching to people who, who had a different interpretation of reality, a different religion and yet despite him being killed, a church grew and it lasted and it was resilient and these Christians were there when, when Father Robert arrived. And after staying with them for a while, he was very impressed by the way, their way of life, the way that they loved one another, the wisdom he found in the community, and he was asked to stay. But he still didn't believe all of the metaphysical 
truths of Christianity or the dogma of Christianity. And so he said to them, well, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily, you know, I love the way you all live, but I don't necessarily buy into all the, the, the beliefs. And they said, follow Jesus with us and God will give you the faith. You, you don't have to have the faith right now. And, and, and now, when, when I arrived in, in Cambridge, Father Robert was here serving as our faithful priest. And, and so th there was something about St. Thomas's witness and the witness of this young man in this community, the witness of the saints, that really worked in Father Robert's life. And I would say that the Holy Ghost worked through these saints. Uh, St. Thomas also has some connection to my life. Uh, we, we've been knit together mystically in some way, I would, I would venture to say. My ancestors are from the, the Isle of Man, and the Isle of Man, uh, there, there was a period in the 1700s where the state of Christianity was, was in shambles in the Isle of Man, and there was a great bishop, Bishop Thomas Wilson, who, who was sent there to try to share the gospel and educate the people and, and educate the clergy who were very ignorant at the time. And so he went, he went to the Isle of Man and he saw an aristocracy that was really taking advantage of, of the poor people and he saw a clergy that were kind of indifferent to the knowledge of, of the people of the island. And so the, the gospel and the catechism had never even been put into the Manx language. And he, he tried to write these things by, by the power of the Holy Ghost. And he started having everyone who was training to become a clergyman live in his home. And he would study the scriptures with them and teach them to, to serve their parishioners and to preach. And he founded libraries and charities to educate and serve the poor. And he translated parts of the Bible and, and the catechism into Manx. And he, he even uh, made a catechism for the Native Americans, the people of my uh, home country. And, and his witness really was, was instrumental in strengthening Christianity on the island. And, and, and also, he, his, his witness ended up affecting places like this parish. And so Bishop Thomas Wilson he, he was one of the great inspirations for the Oxford movement and the Tractarian renewal of, of Catholic faith and, and order in the Church of England. And so that was significant. And he also went, went on to affect the people who would be born on that island. So my ancestor, Thomas Collister, who, who ended up coming over to, to the United States, he was baptized at All Saints Church in Lonan on the Isle of Man. And I, I think that baptism is powerful, and God works through baptism. So Thomas uh, Collister, he didn't have the easiest of lives. lives. He was, he was a, a minor, and he was born out of wedlock, and so his father was not in his life. And he ended up deciding to move to Michigan, uh, where Sarah and I are from, in order to work in the mines and, and make a better life for his family. And on the boat ride over, there was a Methodist preacher who told him, you can convert, you can be born again in Christ, and, and, and you can have a new life. And he was, he was moved by this message, and he decided that he was going to become a preacher, and he was going to share this good news with others. And so after he worked in the mines and saved up enough money to bring his family over, he a actually became a Methodist preacher up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and then later in, in Pontiac. And I, I'm grateful for the work of St. Thomas, uh, of Bishop Thomas Wilson, and, and of my own great-great-grandfather, Thomas Collister. And I think it, it, it had an effect in my life and in the lives of my parents. I, I was raised in a Christian family, and I, my, my father would renovate old abandoned buildings. And so I actually grew up uh, in a bedroom under the bell tower of a, a former Methodist church that had been abandoned. And, and so I, I think the saints... And their, their witness, the way that they bring the light of Christ through the ages, it affects all of us very, very deeply. The, the way that this can help us to see things differently, I, I think, comes into focus when we think about death and when we think about communion. Uh, so I was recently reading Eric Lionel, Canon Eric Lionel Maskell's book, Corpus Christi, and he, he quotes G.K. Chesterton, in, in this, this delightful little maxim of, of Chesterton's, that, that uh, tradition means giving the most obscure of all classes a vote, our ancestors. Tradition is the democracy of the dead. 
And, and uh, Maskell, you can tell, likes the quote. But he says theologically it's a little off, right? Because Christians who die are not actually dead. They are alive in, G- in Jesus Christ, right? They, they are members of the church triumphant. They, they love God and they love us. They are worshiping and they are praying for us. And so Ma- Maskell points out there's a lot of wisdom in this, right? In our society in the West, we tend to think that democracy is, is always good. And so that means that the popular majority is right. And, and so it's very tempting for Christians to conform to our culture. And Chesterton checks that impulse and says, wait a minute, the, we should give the dead a vote. We should give the saints uh, a vote, right? We should look to the wisdom of our ancestors. And, and Maskell says, well, we're not just looking to the, to the wisdom of people rotting in the grave, but we're actually looking to the wisdom of people who are alive, who, who love us, who are, are praying for us and are worshiping God alongside us and and that's really powerful and and so when we look at the words of Jesus today when we look at the Beatitudes and his description of of what it is to to follow him to, to be a peacemaker to be poor in spirit to be to be blessed in these various ways it can look really daunting we all have kind of selfish impulses and you know we, we live in a consumer society and we spend a lot of time just trying to feel good and and you know put our own desires first and so you you look at this list and you think well I, I'm that doesn't really describe me per se and, and so it, it it could be tempting to despair can we even follow Jesus but but one of the wonderful things about the colic today is we don't have to follow him on our own we've been knit together with all of these saints and so you, even it's by, beyond our power to, to follow what Jesus is teaching there, by the power of the Holy Ghost, we can pray the colic today that, that God would grant us the strength to, to follow the example of the saints and to walk with them, right? And, and this is extremely good news. Uh, so even though we're going into lockdown and it, it might feel like we're alone in our apartments, we have the love of God, the love of the saints. We have the example of Jesus Christ, the example of the saints. We're part of a, of a blessed company. And so we can go, we can go do whatever it is that we, we have to do in terms of this difficult period with hope and with gratitude. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.